program is brought to you in partnership with Wheeling National Heritage Area Corporation. Jeremy Morris actually had the idea for this event. Dr. Kirk Hayson is the linguist in the Department of English at WVU. He directs the West Virginia Dialect Project, has investigated English in Appalachia, language variation in the family, and English in North Carolina. The WVDP is also involved in public education about dialect variation and language change. Dr. Hayes is currently section editor for the Language and Linguistics Compass. He is the author of Identity and Ethnicity in the Rural South and co-author of Dialect Change and Maintenance on the Outer Banks. He is here to present Dialects in West Virginia, Fact and Fiction, and How to Learn from Both. Please welcome Dr. Kirk Hayes. Thank you for having me here and for turning out in such great numbers. It's really hard to see this many people interested about language and, and specifically language in our area of the country. If I move around and I'm too quiet, let me know. Uh, so we'll work on that. If you don't have a handout, try to share with someone who does have a handout. Because the handout is going to be somewhat essential to the talk. <coughs> So the first thing we're going to do is take a look on your handout. There's actually a short six-question quiz. Oh, no, pop quiz. Pop it. <laughs> so this quiz, actually, we're going to make it very simple. This is lunch. You're digesting. So this is going to be true or false. All right? So let's work with this. So now what we're going to do is we're going to read the questions and you mark down true or false. And then we're going to take some surveys, see what people think, capture some public opinion. All right, so number one, language is one of our most important cultural inventions. Whoa, no, 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 just mark it down, and then we're going to come back and see. <laughs> All right, number two, language change is a process of decay. Students today, my goodness. Uh, number three, grammar books in schools cover most of the rules and processes of English. <coughs> number four, this one may be a bit esoteric, but through there for fun. Eskimos have 40 words for snow and see snow differently than we do. Would you repeat that, please? Sure. Eskimos have 40 words for snow and see snow differently than we do. And then number five, Appalachian English is Elizabethan English. What kind of finish? Uh, Appalachian English is Elizabethan English. And number six, children require detailed instruction to learn language. Who else, who else needs a hand? I have, I have one extra here that we can do. Kids learn without I'll just read off my screen from here. All right, so let me repeat the question, then all y'all just shout out your answers here. So, so number one, language is one of our most important cultural inventions. True or false? True. True. All right, number two, language change is a process of decay. False. True. True. Okay. Yeah, I, I like the big wave of falseness and the truth comes through. Uh, number three, grammar books in schools cover most of the rules and processes of English. False. False. All right, another way of falseness. Uh, Eskimos have 40 words for snow and see snow differently than we do. True. True. <laughs> All right. Uh, number five, Appalachian English is Elizabethan English. True. Ooh, at the same time, we have truth is false. That's coming up. Uh, number six, children require detailed instruction to learn language. False. All right. People experienced. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We can go through and we can talk about these. Because in talking about dialects, what's important is that we have a decent understanding of how language works. 
And we're just going to touch on little topics today of how language works. If you want to bring up during this talk other issues, <laughs> other points of interest, let me know. I'll either answer them then or fit them in where they come up in the handout. Okay? So this talk is about getting at what you want to know. And we can adjust this fully to do that. All right? So why is language one of our most important cultural inventions? Who said true to that one? All right, so, so why true? Yeah? Uh, because it enables one generation to pass information to another one, for example. All right. And why else true? Form of communication. Form of communication. OK. Anybody say false for this one? Okay. Um, number two. Uh, who said true for number two? Raise your hand. You got true, true, true for number two. So why'd you say true for number two? Oh, number two, number two. Um, that language changes the process of decay. What do you mean by decay? I mean, simplification or, or uh, degradation? Uh, it's a 50-50 answer. <laughs> so, I put false because I don't think it decays so much as it, it transforms into new, they pick up new words, new phraseology. Okay. And so, so not decay, but change. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Who said sure? Or Dave Weicher? Well, I think language was developed over probably hundreds and thousands of years for a specific purpose, intent to convey symbols and the information mm -hmm. and uh, people get lazy after a while i think okay so if you don't think so go to britain and listen to them talk <laughs> as more lazy or less lazy than the u.s pardon me as more lazy or less lazy than the u.s who britain no they're they speak the king's english when you read a newspaper article over there uh, you, there's not a, a lot of unnecessary words like we put in our ums and these, and it's real plain. All right. In my experience. All right. In my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I said yes because um, if you read some of the letters from, say, the founding fathers, mm -hmm. uh, they had just flowery speech, yeah. and even in their you know conversations. Now we just take shortcuts and get you know right to the point. Right. All, all the eloquence that seems to be gone, that's a decay. Right. Right. That, that's the way I interpreted your question. All right. And, and these are all about interpretation. Actually, that's what we're getting at is how we interpret these. All right. So for number three, grammar books cover most of the rules and processes of English. Most of you said false. Okay. And, and why do you say true? All right, so that's where she learned her English. And who said false? All right, and why false? Well, because I think with the time the kids learn something in one grade, two grades later, they've forgotten that and they've added two others, subtracted from it. So, so they forget along the way as as they were. And you were saying, sir? I believe you learned your uh, grammar at home when you're young, around your fr friends and family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so s the school may try to change it a bit, but uh, many of these habits are developed very early. Very early. All right, so number four. Number four was our Eskimos, 40 words for snow. All right, this one was really mixed in our answers. Who here said true for this one? All right, and, and why true? I read the book Smile and Sense of Snow, which is Eskimo detective uses the many different words, and also the characteristic of snow changes so she can track down the criminal. All right, so had it in the literature. Who else had true here? Did you enter? I didn't watch her. We had a textbook one time which talked about how important snow was to the Eskimos building the igloo, etc. Right. The snow, et cetera. They had different words for different qualities. Just like other cultures have different words for the fruit, whether it's ripe, overripe. Rotten. So there were, in your textbook, there was a cultural discussion of Eskimos and Snow. All right, so who said false for this one? Uh, false? No, just, all right, false one. I, I, I 
hit hydrant there that if this um, statistic that's put out there was a falsehood. Okay. There wasn't 40 words for snow. And uh, they live with it more than we do. They probably have a different appreciation for it than we do. All right, so probably 40 that, or yeah. more or less than 40. All right. Well, number five. So we have Appalachian, which is Elizabethan. I think the way here was true. Who said true here? No, so you said true, and then why true? I grew up in a part of West Virginia where many of the early settlers had been uh, paid soldiers. They came over and stayed in that part of that English state. All right. All right. Who else had true down here? And why true? I think back in the New Deal days, they actually went down into the mountains and did research on those people. The songs they were singing, a lot of those, their music was Elizabethan. Mm -hmm. Dr. Patrick Gaynor did that at WVU. Right, you're right. He was my predecessor. He got teaching the classes that he used to teach. Except without a guitar, I don't have a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should. All right, and who said false for this one? Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm full of lunch. Um, well, I'm from Southern Mountains of West Virginia. My um, neighbors and I never talk like Shakespeare or Spencer. <laughs> right. <laughs> we didn't use the vocabulary of Shakespeare and Spencer, nor the syntax. Right. Okay, and then the last one here. Uh, children require the detailed instructional learn language. We had overwhelming false here, as you know. Children simply acquire language if they're exposed to language. Actually, sadly, every once in a while, some humans are not exposed to any language, and they don't then develop language. All right? So here is the first difficult moment of our talk. Because from the field of linguistics, and I'm a linguist, which means we scientifically study language, we look at how it works, we look at its history, it's social influence. From the field of linguistics, all of these are false. And I can explain why. The first one, now some of these are false because it's a little tricky, the question. So. The first one is false because language is not an invention. It's not that it's not important. Yes, it's important. But regardless of your religious background or your views on evolution slash creation, no human invented language. We invent words, but not language. And we continually reinvent words. Language is a biological endowment. It comes as with the child when the child is born. Not a language like English or French or Russian but the ability to acquire language, that comes prepackaged in the infant when born. Number two, language is not decay in that it's changing and the systems that work also change. The words change, sometimes the sounds change, sometimes over centuries, sometimes over decades. But the language Language's ability to work stays the same. So what we think, one thing we know about language is that all living languages are undergoing change. There's no such thing as a language that's alive that isn't undergoing change right now. For the third one, the rules and processes of English, actually most of the rules that you know of any language, English included, are, have never been taught to you. You've never formally learned them. You learn the majority of them by the time you were five. The rest of them by the time 13 or so. The things you actually learn in school mostly have to do with writing, which is not natural, and genres. So how to write for specific audiences, how to speak for specific audiences speak differently here than you do over there. And it's that kind of formal training which is much different from acquiring language. Now on the Eskimos and the 40 words for snow, this is actually just an urban legend that people have used again and again. 
Now, the New York Times once reported earlier in the 20th century that the number of words was up to 100. But they just increased or decreased the number of words as it fancied them. The actual number of words of the Inuit tribes, who are called Eskimos, have are about 12. And what you can do are add prefixes and suffixes on them. So if you think of something like snow, and then snowy, and then ice, and then icy, and powder, and flakes, and slush, and sleet, we also have lots of words for snow. All right. The reason why this was such a big, huge urban legend taught by anthropologists and others is for two reasons. One, it made those tribes seem exotic. Two, it implied that your language controls your thought, which was a big sort of political effort uh, in the earlier decades. But for the last 30 years, linguists and other people who study the mind uh, have been dissuaded of that belief. All right, Appalachian English, Elizabethan English. Quite unfortunately, I left this myth off the handout, and I probably should have included it, but we can go into it as much as you would like to. The basic rundown on Elizabethan English is that it ended in 1603. Jamestown wasn't even founded until what year? 1607. 1607. The settlement of this Appalachian region was considerably later than that. But even if, even if you consider aliens beamed up, beamed down, Elizabethan English speakers to the mountains, their language wouldn't be the same as it is today because all living languages change. It would have necessarily have changed. Things are changing between different countries, so Australian English, British English is different from US English. It's actually more innovative. They've had more changes. American English looks very conservative compared to other English varieties. But that itself has changed. <laughs> And, and then the last one, yes. Children, if they're exposed to language, will acquire language. Some communities around the world don't even directly talk to their children until their children are able to talk themselves. They can't answer you, so why talk to them? Those children develop normal language at the same rate as other communities. So it's not even direct address that's required. It's language in the environment. Whether it's sign language or spoken language, the children will acquire. And that's part of what is so beautiful and wonderful about human language. It's a natural ability we have to acquire language. Any questions here before we go on into some of the Appalachian discussion? Because this talk is about answering questions you may have. Yes? Well, why is it some people say Appalachian? Here's your preference, mine is Appalachian, and I assume it's a regional or south kind of thing, because I associate Appalachian with southern Appalachians. This is, this is one, the, the, the linguistic reason why is because we're putting stress on different syllables. The social reason is, escapes me completely. And I get asked this all the time. I have yet to come up with a good boundary for this region says this, this region says that. Because people keep telling me different things. It seems to vary within communities. It seems to vary uh, across the state, and across the Appalachian states. I, I, I want to find any social reason. I don't know why. The linguistic reason is simple. The social reason is fascinating. I don't know. But you, you think it's a southern? Well, I, I lived in northern
must be a cor correct pronunciation for American English, or else how would the dictionaries tell you how to speak? So from where do they take this correct pronunciation? All right. There's, there's, this is a great question. I'm glad you're asking this one early. The answer is not going to be all that pleasing. It's not that there's not correct ways to speak. It's that there are many of them. So it's not that there's a form that is viewed as correct. It's that there's a plurality of them. Where do dictionaries get their pronunciations? You have to remember, there is no such thing as the dictionary. There's not. WV Library has over 600 dictionaries. The downtown campus. The reason why is because dictionaries are surveys. A dictionary is nothing but a survey of what people are using. If people use different things, they rewrite the dictionary and sell you a new one. They like to do that. So, dictionaries pick out what the variety of people use and then grade it on things like social class. And say, well, this is this class, or no, no, this is global. And I know America is not supposed to be about social class, but it is. Now, our dictionaries, the one I would recommend, I'm not sure if we have it in this library, but we might, is the Dictionary of American <coughs> Regional English, published by Harvard Press. This is a dictionary that covers all the regional forms of words that you can find in the United States. So for example, probably someone in here knows the term spider for a cooking utensil. What is a spider? It's a cast iron skillet or a cast iron right. with, with legs on it. That, 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 that's in the dictionary of every regional language. That won't be in other general dictionaries. Is the word spider wrong to refer to that? No, not as likely. Now, this probably doesn't answer your question. Well, I, I read it in, in one dictionary yes. many years ago that there was a small geographic area from Western Pennsylvania through Indiana mm -hmm. that that was what was used for the correct pronunciation of words in English. That may be that dictionary's basis, but there are lots of other dictionaries that. You almost always dictionaries do not go with simply regional divides. So for example, the word C-O-T, and we're going to get to this later in the handout, but C-O-T and then C-A-U-G-H-T. Say those out loud. C-O-T. C-A-U-G-H-T. All right. If you say these two words the same, that's said to be a merger. So you pronounce caught and caught the same way. I'm from Michigan, suburban Detroit, and I say caught and caught. Okay, should that pronunciation be the basis for the dictionary? Well, in that dictionary, if they did that basis, those two words would be merged and mine would be non-standard. Okay, that's fine. That isn't the way it is in most American dictionaries, but if that's that one, that's great. But yeah, dictionaries also have usage panels, and you know when people use this word, what does it mean? Because remember, meanings of words are changing also. That's that's part of what human language is about. All right. Okay. Well, let's let's move on here and see what other kinds of things we get into. And as you have questions, please ask. That's how we get things. Figured out. All right, we have some definitions for you. There's more to read on this handout than we're going to go through. Certainly, that is for you if you want to make copies of the handout. For friends who don't have handouts, I apologize. I should have brought more. You can see some myths down there about language. One of the things about modern linguistics is we study language the same way biologists study life. We look at the system of language, we see how it works, and we say that species X works well and so does species Y. We also note that some dialect varieties are stigmatized. Some are seen as bad. That's 
not part of how they work linguistically, it's part of how they're evaluated socially. The reason they get evaluated that way is because of the social status of the speakers, which is something different from linguistics. So let's move on, and you can see on page two some comic strips, some traditional perception of Appalachian English. Um, here, this is a comic strip. This might be an interesting room to ask this question. Does anyone know the full name of this comic strip? Snuffy Smith. Snuffy Smith yeah, is a shortened name. That's right. Now, does anybody know the full name? All right. It is actually Barney Google and Snuffy Smith. Uh, there we go. Barney Google was originally inked in 1919 and went downhill around the 1930s in popularity. Up until Barney Google <clears throat> came across this one fellow in this trip who shot at him. First trip, Snuffy Smith shot at him. And after Snuff Snuffy Smith was introduced, this Appalachian Hill building, the popularity of this strip soared. This strip is now distributed and printed in 19 different languages around the world. For most people on Earth, this is Appalachian English. <laughs> so, so I get, I get emails from Russia, Australia, all over the place asking about features that are in here. Interestingly, some of the features in here are actually found in the area, um, and, and some aren't. So if you look at the second strip, the first panel, it says Winder. You can find that in areas of West Virginia, but you can also find that in other areas of Appalachia. The first panel of the first strip, you see the word your, Y-O-R-E. That's what's called, if you want a bit of terminology, that's called a spelling block. That's called I-dialect, E-Y-E dialect. And what that represents is a spelling version of a dialect but there's no actual pronunciation difference. So as far as I can tell, that would be your, your. What the spelling is supposed to indicate is the social status of the speaker. It's supposed to indicate education level, perhaps. But it, it actually doesn't represent a feature of the dialect. So that's called high dialect. You're using a lot of literature. Um, I like authors of literature, but very few of them, if any, are actually consistent in the way they represent dialect. <coughs> You can see some, yes ma'am? It, it has been translated, as last I was told, it was 19 different languages. What, what seemed to happen is they hit the written representation of whatever rural dialect they have. So for example, in Norway, there's two different languages, two different written forms. And the more country version is the one they print this in. So they, they go with the same kind of representation, rural versus urban. And they put whatever sounds hickish in their language in this strip. And, but it's a good question. It, it's, it's a question that lots of scholars kind of ponder. Is, is it the same thing? Uh, it, uh, this also works with films that are uh, dubbed into other languages. What do you do with a um, a film like Boys in the Hood when you need to put it into German. Now, do they have an equivalent dialect? And if, if they have an urban variety, uh, that seems to be what people do. You see there a B on the definition from the New York Evening Journal of a hillbilly, and that's actually cited in uh, the Dictionary of American Regional English. And then you have this definition. This is from a fellow who actually was born in Cabell County, West Virginia and they lived for 50 years outside Detroit. Uh, this, this here is Silas. I got a little, got a little passage to play in here, see if we can hear this. They always used to go to the West Virginia hillbilly, and uh, I'd ask them what the definition of the hillbilly was. So they would tell me, but you do you know what the definition of the hillbilly is? I mean, it's an, an art, an art, uh, 
That's why they call it the natural human definition of dictionary field. So, what he was pointing out, yes, sir. Did he get back to that Barney Google script? Sure thing. There's a song about Barney Google that has a very strange contraction in it. Oh, really? It goes, Barney Google, where did you get those eyes? Where did, where? Where did you get those eyes? Did the whole thing shortened eyes? down? Yeah, I I suspect that anything related it would be as short as this to kind of represent it as possible. I didn't know there was a song, though. I will have to search that out. I mean, I have a right to. So perhaps I can have you sing it after we are going to record it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, if you skip over, so one of the one of the fictions about West Virginia, and there's some standard jokes that people send me on the first page, on on page two there. Then as we flip over to page three, um, there's something called, a website called Hillponics. Now, this, this first fiction about West Virginia or Appalachian English is that the English itself is the result of some kind of intelligence level, and it's not at all true. But what you get, if you take a look at this Hillbonics site, and this is, of course, after the 96-97 firestorm that came from the Ebonics debate, which I think was we're heavily involved in. But this is a internet website that purports not to make fun of Southern speech or Southern West Virginian speech. But on the other hand, if you look at the graphic there where the child's writing on the board, obviously some fun is being poked at this variety. And what they represent are words or pronunciations that are considered local in the area. <coughs> Some of them are only local, but actually most of them are shared with other varieties, which is fine. That's normal in dialect studies. But the wide variety of words does not indicate any kind of ignorance in them. Now, if you flip over to the next page, where this here we're looking at number two. There we go. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at list A. Now, lots of dialects have lots of different qualities to them. If you're going to actually describe a dialect, there's hundreds of things you have to take into account of. But every once in a while, you get a dialect which has just one thing that everyone knows about. For varieties of English in Appalachia, the one thing that people worldwide know about is this A prefix. So if you have a phrase like, she is fishing, and you get, she's a fishing, that little tidbit is something that people know about this variety all around the world. Now, I'll point out a little something about it, but first, what I want to do is go through with you, and this is probably a very good room to do this in, how it works. And we're going to do this by looking at the rules of this. Because people have the perception that this A prefix is somehow unintelligent, ignorant. Actually, it's a very complex linguistic process. The complexity of it and how it's stereotyped are two different things. And that's what we're hoping to point out here. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to read list A. 1, A, B. And I'm going to put in the A prefix for you. What I want you to do is mark down, force choice, A or B, which one sounds better, which one sounds more natural. All right? And then we're going to compare that to what native speakers have for this. So in other words, people who use this, what would they normally have? All right? So this is easier than it sounds. Number one, a building is hard work. She was a building a house. Mark down A or B. Go. A building is hard work. She was a building a house. All right, number two. He likes a hunting. He went to hunting. And number three. The child was a charming the adult. The child was very a charming.
All right. So let's take a survey here. Uh, for number one, what you put down? A or B? A. Hey. Oh, everybody shout out there. What you put down? A or B for number one? A. Hey. All right. B with a fronting of A's. Uh, number two, A or B? B. A. Hey. All right. And number three? B. A. Hey. Okay. The answers, the correct answers for people who use this variety, and yes, there is a correct and incorrect here, because the native speakers have the pattern, and then you measure whether people follow the pattern or not, is B, B, A. All right. So here, for all of you people who like to look at words and other things, here we have one in one A and B, the word building. What is the difference between the word building and one A? Building is hard work. And one B, she was building a house. One's a noun and one's a verb. One's nouny and one's verby. That's right. So in one B, you have a verb. It's verby. Whether it's a verb itself is another question. But the A prefix, the first rule of A prefixing is that it can only attach to verbs. That's a rule that whether you're four years old and using this or 84 and using this is part of your linguistic system. All right, but there's more rules to it. So let's take a look at number at this B here. And I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to read them out loud. You can down A or B. Number one, they make money by building houses. Or B, they make money of building houses. They make money by building houses, or B, they make money of building houses. And two, people can't make enough money of fishing, or B, people can't make enough money from the fishing. People can't make enough money of fishing, or people can't make enough money from the fishing. Three, People destroy the beauty of the island through littering, or B, people destroy the beauty of the island through littering. All right. So what you put down for number one, A or B? B. All right. Number two? A. Number three? A. All right. The answers are B, A, B. Now, what's the difference between, let's say, number one, between the sentence of one and the sentence of one A and the sentence of one B? Preposition, right. That word, that preposition, preposition, by, marks the location. The A prefix, five centuries ago, used to be itself a preposition. It used to be something like, she was on working. So if someone asked where is she, he said she's on working, that meant right that second, it was a present, present mark. It marked the very moment of actual speaking. After a while, that faded down to just the uh, just a schwa sound as the marker. But it still had the qualities of a preposition. And there's a general rule in English that you can't have two prepositions next to each other in the same phrase. So you cannot have, she is in at the store. So there's a grammatical constraint on verbs, and there's also a constraint that it can't go next to prepositions. But there's one more constraint that goes with the C prefix. That's in C, which is split over the page. So let's see. She was a discoverer in a trail. She was a follower in a trail. She was a discovering the trail. She was a follower in the trail. Two, she was repeating the chant, she was a hollering chant. She was, a, she was a repeating the chant, she was a hollering chant. And three, they were a figure of the change, they were forgetting the change. They were, they were a forgetting the change, they were a figure, wow, 
They were figuring the change, they were forgetting the change. All right. So for number one, what you have down, A or B? B. Number two? B. And number three? A. All right, that's right, B, B, A. So those little marks over the word, what are those marks? Those are accents or stress marks, that's right. The rule here is that the A prefix has to be attached to a word where the stress, the accent, is on the first syllable. So this supposedly ignorant marker actually has a complex linguistic system where it has to attach to verbs, it cannot be next to prepositions, and in terms of its phonology, its sound system, it has to be a word with word initial stress. Natives who have this feature acquire it like all of us acquire our language without consciously thinking about it. It's just going in and their brain does lots of beautiful work. That it socially stigmatizes something that's bad is another factor worth another talk, certainly. But the linguistics of it clearly shows that it's not an ignorant feature. We are actually running quickly out of time, actually slightly past time. Let me point out one thing about A prefixing, and this is going to be later on in the handout. Um, this will be, let's see here. There's a, there's a page with, that says age division for two mergers. Um, it's page seven, and I realize the numbers do not keep but on the page, on the bottom of page 7, in what's labeled as table 4.3, we took a survey of 89 speakers. Now this is a wide range of 89 speakers, and we looked for, we had an hour of interview time, or more than an hour of interview time for each one. What we found is that only the older speakers in the group had this feature. Actually, we didn't find any speakers born after 1947 who had this A prefix feature. So it seems to be fading in the Appalachian region. It's still the poster child for the varieties of English, but how much is used on a daily basis, in a non-performative basis, is, is a different kind of question. That doesn't mean that the variety is fading, it just means the features that represent it are changing. So one of the things that represents Appalachian English nowadays is at the top of that page in that graph. Here, and I'll, I'll explain to you, where it says the F flax, the front lax, that's a merger of words like pin and pen. Pin and pen. Pronounces pin and pin. Where you have ink pin and stick pin. You distinguish the two because you say it exactly the same. That's generally a southern feature. As far as we know, it's not a feature of the northern pen anyway. Now, the low back merger, the merger between cot caught is a feature of wheeling and has been for some time. And it's a feature that's spread all the way throughout the south of the state. What you see here in this graph is that people under 40 have, in West Virginia are more likely to have both pin and pen said the same and caught and caught said the same. So that itself is different than a lot of other American varieties. Mergers themselves are a perfectly normal part of the development of English. If you think of a word like F-O-R and F-O-U-R, these used to be pronounced differently. Most people in the U.S. nowadays pronounce them the same as four and four. Let me just play a few passages for you at the end of the handout. And we will finish up here. 
The first one is found at the bottom of page 8, number 4.7, called Musical Palette. This is a teenager from, West, from Logan County, West Virginia. And even though this 14 year old is a southerner and grew up in what's considered the South, she doesn't use the word y'all. Now, this is someone who's not traveled anywhere else. But. Now, you don't say y'all want to Now, where do you think of your best name? I just try to respect what my word is, but I'll say y'all, I can't stand it. When did this come in? I want to hear about this. So, oh my God, right? Now, do you consider yourself Southern? Yeah. But you don't want to be in jail? Y'all from record, is here? They did say that they are so what you find as for terms of influence from outside areas, you find that stereotypes do have an effect at times, even on people who have to travel, in choosing these high profile items. Now what it's not affecting are, um, for example, the changes in her vowel system. Here's a couple, I mean, let's go to the last ones here. Uh, I'm gonna, this very same page where we have Marvin, Lisa, and Lisa. Would it help if I held this speaker up to this microphone yes. and project it back? Okay, that's what I was talking about. We'll try to avoid all kinds of feedback here. I 
I would, I would order this fry and then do the fry. Now I'm going to Okay, so you, you said, I'd like this fry. And there's a fry. Fry. Yeah. And there's a fry. Yeah. Yeah. It happens so many times. I love him. People, every day, people, say, say that word again. I want to hear that word. Um, just get a ring from it. So one of the things to keep in mind is that early divides, early divides of migration um, in West Virginia, the divide between the North and the South, and uh, the Civil War, which is still part of the dialect making of the isoglosses of West Virginia, that these features still have an influence today on speech, but there's a lot of complexities running around there with it. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. If there's a takeaway message here, it's that language and dialects are very complex, but are worth looking at and worth learning about. If you have any questions or want to know suggestions for books to read, I'll be glad to help you out with those too. Thank you very much. Yes, you didn't. You didn't mention certain things. I've been here for 20 years. I came. I came from New York City. Okay, right. which everybody notices right away. Okay, um, I noticed something that's in print, and I've never seen it anywhere else. And I've lived in a lot of different places yeah. uh, in time. And that is things I call it telegraphic, where they stop and say instead of saying the house needs painting. It needs painted. Yes. It needs washed. Yes. You know what I mean? It's, it's another tense. And it's in print in the newspapers. Now, if somebody picks up the paper from Wheeling and reads it in New York, they're going to think that's incorrect. Right. Not realizing that it's an idiom of the area. Yeah. Oh, not realizing, yes. This is actually, if you want, I can send you academic articles in this one. Um, this is a feature, I, I need a map of the U.S. to do this justice. This is a feature that runs from basically this area west, but through Illinois, Indiana, covering a big oval shape. Of uh, what, 10 million, 20 million speakers in that area? Basically, the verb need, verbs are controllers, they're little despots, they're rulers of the sentence. And verbs say, well, no, I need an action to come afterwards, or no, I need a whole phrase to come afterwards. The verb need in lots of places in the US requires a verb phrase, that you need to be this. In this area, this oval shaped area in the middle, you need an adjective to come afterwards. And that's the difference, whether you need an adjective or a verb phrase. It's something that I actually grew up with. I didn't even know it was a dialect feature of anywhere until I was 28 giving one of these talks a woman in the back, actually from Ohio County, stood up and said, what do we do about this problem in the schools? And gave this example. And I stood there and said, what problem? <laughs> <laughs> and I had no idea. Um, so it's something I use in my own writing, and my editors just get over it. Uh, and I write for an international audience. Uh, if, if in England they can put the periods after quotes, and, and or, and then in the, or inside quotes, and we can put them in the other place. Um, we can tolerate this kind of variation around. Um, we're going to go here in the middle of it and back. Um, I wanted to tell you a story about I was teaching in New Zealand, teaching high school, uh -oh. and I got teased about my accent so much that I went to a new school and I decided to trick the kids. And the principal invited all the new teachers up on stage, but he didn't say where we were from. And he just said, this is Miss Gwynn, and you'll notice she speaks quite differently. So when the kids came in the classroom, I said, we're going to have a good year, we're going to have a good time, and if you're all good, I'll teach you to talk just like me, and their jaws drop. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, what's that? You don't think I talk funny? And they went. <laughs> and I said, would you like to learn to speak like me? And they said, yeah. So I, I, on this side of Blackboard, I phonetically wrote, um, I sure ain't a tar. 
And on this side, I'm like, we're going to put push that cushion over here and set a spell. Well, the kids learned to say that. And by the time we got, I got back to the lunchroom, the principal came up to me and said, I sure am tarred. <laughs> Did they have any association of, I mean, did they have any idea where? Yeah, to them it was Beverly Hillbilly Talk. Yeah. And so that, that's why they wanted to learn it. And, and it was so funny because the first parent teacher's night, I had parents lined up around the block who wanted to <laughs> learn to speak it too. So I had to, come, I had to come up with a word that I hadn't taught the kids. So I told them about how in West Virginia we have these little buildings on top of the hills called bar cars. <laughs> they, right. they just shook their heads. They're called what? I said, they're four cars. A fire tower. Four <laughs> that, that's very nice. Uh, the, there's actually some changes going on in New Zealand that are also going on in the southern part of Appalachia. Not, not the way like contact, but the same linguistic changes are going on in the vowel system. So I'm sure this was quite a fascinating bit for them. Yes? I don't mean to be disrespectful if there's anyone here from Wetzel County. But <laughs> <laughs> we all have the same equipment. We go 25 miles south of here, uh -huh. and the folks sound like they're from Georgia and South Carolina. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? It's, it's actually a really good question. One of the things that seems to be happening in not just West Virginia, but rural areas, is what used to be just the normal dialect is being separated out by towns or urban areas where you're having influx of migrants. We do not have a good picture of this yet. So what we find, so for example, this pin pen merger, which is a southern feature, to be sure. All my in-laws in North Carolina have this. 100%, is found in the northern part of West Virginia, but only in the outlying rural areas, not with folks from Morgantown itself. So what seems to be going on is that southernness isn't always geographic, how far south, how far north, but southernness as a cultural trait is how rural versus how urban. So one of the things we're going to look at in future studies is we're going to compare two high schools. Um, in my county, it would be Morgantown High School versus Clay Mattel, which is a rural high school. We're going to look at students from two different high schools, a rural one and an urban one. Not that far apart, that far apart in terms of miles, but what are the differences? And how do the, the social, um, the culture, what people like to do, how do they like to hang with, how does that reinforce a southern speech versus non-southern speech, whether it's strictly northern or not. But you're absolutely right. There is that divide, and it's not a smooth geographic boundary. So if you take a look at the map on the handout um, from, oh, which page? It's really the only map on there. It's uh, 3.1, it's Kurat's Word uh, Geography of the Eastern U.S. Um, areas 11 and 12 are northern and southern West Virginia. And you can see 10 there cuts off uh, their part of the northern panhandle. But even within these areas, even let's say area 11, there are lots of southern features but it depends on where you are in terms of other social factors. Yes, ma'am? How do you factor out the effect of media on people's speech when you do these studies? The, the easy answer is we don't. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a huge problem, isn't it? For no. It, it, it's not nearly as huge as you might imagine. The influence of media, everything from radio early on, television, now text messaging, internet, is on the words, is on lexical items. You create a new word out in California, you can have it in the East Coast within minutes. With text messaging, and I have making each other. So, I, I have a student who just went to Denmark, and I, I, I am her in real time. We're halfway around the world. 
So it's, it's on lexical items. It's not on vowels. It's not on patterns of sound systems. Actually, the U.S. is getting more diverse, not less diverse. That surprises me, because I would think it would standardize for the television and the radio. No, it, it seems that the, especially Basically, because there's not any corrective force, you can listen to Dan Rather, Walter Cronkite, Peter Jennings, and you don't notice that Peter Jennings is Canadian, Dan Rather is Texan. And you can, especially if Dan Rather emphasizes it, but the kids themselves don't notice that their vowels are going to be different from those, so they can understand lots of different varieties. But that doesn't mean that it's going to change, for example, the vowel system of children all over. So right now, over the 20th century, the big story of the 20th century in terms of dialect change is that the vowel system, the way your vowels are pronounced in the northern cities, is changing drastically the way they're being pronounced in the southern U.S. For example, the word bat, B-A-T, the A vowel in northern cities around Detroit, Chicago, has moved to a vowel like E, bet. That's taken place in the last few decades, really, since the 1950s. In the southern U.S., some of the changes are between words like bed, being pronounced be it. So we have an e with an a, be it. These vowel systems are moving in different places. The media, which became a big part, radio first and the TV, seems to have not affected this at all. Yes? As a newcomer to this area, I find the O sound to be very distinctive here. I went to Lowe's recently and asked for an orange extension cord, and the woman said, you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> I didn't know that. And then, well, out here, I have trouble saying it. We call it or orange. Or orange. They recognize us right away. <laughs> I, I recognize yeah. <laughs> Sometimes things hang on. So, for example, in English, we used to make sentences negative with the negation before the verb. So instead of I have not gone, it would have been I ne have gone. The ne, the negative would have been first. Now, this has been lost everywhere in English, except in this one word willy-nilly. Willy-nilly meaning sort of all over the place. It actually comes from the expression will it, sort of be it so, or ne, 
will be it not so. But that is the only place in English that's been frozen and stuck. Yes, Sure. I, I can talk about eight more than we had time for. But <laughs> the word ink is a normal bit of language that developed a good time ago, at least six centuries. What ink does is it provides one form, one function for the present tense B paradigm. So what you get is instead of am not, is not, are not, you get one form that says, hey, I'm present tense negative B. In some uh, communities it has been considered standard, in other communities it's been considered completely non-standard. It's been all over the charts. It, it's a poster child of non-standard English all over the English-speaking world. It, it's not going anywhere, and it's, it's now such a lovely bit of non-standard English that non-standard <laughs> users don't want it to go anywhere. Uh, now, you think about, think about something like Amit. Uh, U.S. speakers are not Amit speakers, but there are some varieties, um, Scottish English, some varieties of Scottish English speaking, part of that, that say, uh, I uh, am doing well today, Amit I. And they can use Amit in that way. That makes us you know, raise our eyebrows. What is what would you use instead of amitai in that expression? But as a, as a contracted tan, aren't I? You would actually use a third person or the plural form, which seems a bit out of place. Well, that's out of place because it's avoiding ain't. <laughs> so, okay, up front, and then. I was born in Indiana, but I've been out here since 1948. But lately, I've noticed that, especially when I was at the Dairy Queen, and I asked them for a sack, they looked at me like, what did you ask for? Right. And ask them for a poke and see what they ask. They were like, what do you have? Yeah. Is that a generational thing, or is it just a regional thing? That's a generational thing. Um, the, the word sack is, uh, may be used um, by certain generations now, it may be used, and it is used in country and western songs, but it is a word that uh, has a large number. Matter. So it's, it's probably not going to be used a whole lot. But what do you call it? Yeah, exactly. They, they see it as a regional difference. But here, back in the Yes. Same thing here. Uh, possibly so, although that one, the creek crit probably has identifiable social divide. The roof, roof, probably less so. That's probably less socially classified in any way, shape, or form. Any word you have in English today that is spelled with a double O, or used to be pronounced as O, quote, lo, flo, they, they spelled it with double O because it had the long O sound. They, they weren't crazy. The language has changed on them after they set the spelling. The roof, roof example is one where the U of roof is the earlier form. The U uh of roof is the later form. And uh, either you use the innovative one or you use the older one. But and this, this, uh, words like S-O-O-T, um, soot, or I know plenty of speakers in North Carolina have soot. Um, but you think words like blood, flood, those all used to be oo and before that o. Oh. So that's part of the progression of the vowels changing. Yes? A few moments ago you mentioned about the North Carolinians being mm -hmm. ashamed of their language when they were being interviewed. Yes. Well, we make fun of the mountain people up and down up the lakes. You're saying et for eat. Yes. Well, I heard the Queen of England say, we at supper. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's a lot of, one thing to keep in mind about dialects is that the quality of the feature itself has nothing to do with the social view, with social stigmatization. So for example, nowadays, in the US South, not pronouncing your R's is seen as rural and bad. 
So if you don't have an R in a word like card, cod, I'm, I'm a bad R list speaker, but in a word like cod, for card, it's seen as bad. You're seen as rural and educated as negative. The interesting thing about that is for England, I'll show New Zealand and lots of other places, that it's a prestige for. That's the highest level you can get. But uh, it's the same feature. It's the exact same linguistic process. But the social value is different. And I'll give you one more example. And this will be interesting uh, geographically here. In the southern United States, uh, in areas of North Carolina at least, if you have the word birthday, you can have it pronounced as birthday. In that area, it is socially unremarked. Everyone has it, every ethnic group, every social class. No one notices. Speech pathologists come down to the area and they go, what's going on? It's just part of the area. Around Detroit, where I grew up, birthday was seen as lower socioeconomic status. It was seen as bad and picked on and, and gone after in the schools. David Beckham has it. He makes $5 million a year. No one questions his sound. <laughs> uh, the social motivation for this kind of stigma is social. You have to look at the social reasons for that. The linguistic reasons keep rolling. There are concerned. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Yes, Public Library.